Good morning, River Oak Church. Today we're going to be reading from God's Word, the Gospel of Luke, excuse me, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. And now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mountain of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophets, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when they entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Please be seated. Quickly, I have a few announcements this morning. The first is next Sunday is that's right, Easter Sunday. I know that y'all are my devout 9.30 a.m. Uh, congregants, but if you f could think about it, possibly coming to the 8 a.m. service or possibly the 11.15 service so that we can continue the parking blessing. Also, we have an extra special uh, service on Sunday, excuse me, on Saturday before Easter at 6.30 p.m. So if you're so inclined or would like to attend service on Saturday at 6.30 here at River Oak Church. Also, we're having a health fair April 13th. Basically, what that is, is an ultrasound of your blood vessels. They're going to check several different parts of the body uh, for any type of buildup in your blood vessels. The great thing is, again, it is an ultrasound. There's no contrast and no dye, nothing evasive, just a simple ultrasound. And if you're interested in that, there's a booth set up just outside in the foyer. Thank you. Good morning. Man, it's a lot of stuff going on, right? It is Palm Sunday today. It's a good day, right? A little cold. I thought it was supposed to be spring. Put a short sleeve t-shirt on and went back in the house, put a jacket over. <laughs> but we're, just, we're really glad you're here. If you're, if you're visiting with us for the first time, we're, we're happy. We're glad that you're able to join us. If you're regulars, we're happy you're here too. If you come next week on Saturday at 630, we're going to be about 30 minutes into it. So come at six. <laughs> also, um, Sunday, we are going to be having the hub or the gym will be open for overflow, but you won't be like secondhand citizens. There's going to be live music in there. At the same time, live music is going on in here. Um, we'll, be have, we'll have our own worship set going on over there, and then we'll just ship whatever's going on over here in the hub for the service. So we look forward to you joining us during that time, and we're excited for what this week represents. We're excited for what God is doing in the lives of this church. And we're going to continue that this morning. We're going to, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a walk or a journey, hopefully, of Christ's last week on earth and what that looks like. And we're, I'm going to take it like a movie or a play. We're all, at least I'm a fan of movies and plays. But we're going to separate today's message kind of in three-ish type of Scenarios. One is if today is Palm Sunday, which it is, it's the prolong of what's going on. It's the beginning of the movie. If we're looking at Monday through Thursday time frame, that's going to be the scenes of the show, of the movie. And then Friday, Good Friday, will be the epilogue, the end. But the key is we've all read the story, and so we know that's not the end of the story. Amen? And so we're looking forward to that. Every good movie, though, has a flashback scene, right? Kind of develops the character that we're looking at, tells us what we need to know as we look at that. And so we'll have a moment 
in today's sermon that we're going to look at the backstory or the flashback of what significance. So today's text, we're going to dive in, and we're just going to go verse by verse when we get to it, and we're going to look at the history and what that represents for us. So the scene starts right now about 1,991 years ago today is when this took place. And I kind of want to paint a picture of the, the level of where this was at. We know that in Jerusalem at that time, the Lord came in on the triumphal entry. There was probably about 2.65 million people in Jerusalem celebrating the feast at that time. 2.65 million people. That's a lot of people. Put it in perspective, they usually had about 25 to 60,000 people in Jerusalem at the time. 2.65 million. So if you don't know what that is, think of the city of Chicago. All its population goes to Jerusalem and is there. All right, if you're a southerner, the city of Houston, it's close to 2.65. That's a lot of people in one small area. Virginia Beach is like 455,000, Chesapeake's 255,000. So even us together, that's not even half of who is present at this Passover, at this triumphal entry. And so I think it's key. And so as we look at that, we look at the numbers, you say, how do I know how many people were there? Well, I'll tell you how I know. Because <laughs> historians track the number of lambs that were sold to be slaughtered. They tracked the number of lambs. So there was about 265,500 lambs slaughtered during that time. That's a lot of lambs. It's one lamb per 10 people, give or take, family unit. So there is a lot of people here to celebrate what was getting ready to happen. Now, I haven't seen a crowd that big. The closest I've ever come was during Mardi Gras. So I lived in New Orleans for five-ish years. People in New Orleans left New Orleans during Mardi Gras, unless you're part of the, the festivities, because it was too crazy to be around. And if you ever experienced it, you know what I'm talking about. I think one time my wife and I um, did a couple of the floats. I think I went with some friends, and I recognized very quickly that this is a place I did not want to be. The enormous amount of people on top of each other, banging into each other, kind of the, the drunkenness, the, the festival at atmosphere, the traffic— you think we have parking problems. It's horrible. And Mardi Gras is only about 1.5 million. Just over half of who is there. So just picture what is going on here. So our movie is going to start with the flashback. The flashback here is going to be in the form of Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. You can turn to it. I'm just going to uh, run through a few of the verses. And the flashback is going to be found in verse, between verses 3 and 13. It's a very familiar story. Many of us have seen the cartoon or watched the movies or hopefully have read the scripture. And it's really when Pharaoh has enslaved the Hebrews for hundreds of years— and where we're picking up the story is Moses with Aaron as his mouthpiece, by the direction of God, is being sent to get his people free. We all know the story, right? At this time, this is at the point of the 10th plague. And the 10th plague is where basically all the Egyptians, there was going to be the death of all the firstborns, all the firstborns in Egypt. And that's not just any firstborn. That's the firstborns from the Pharaoh's house, the firstborn from the slave girl, and the firstborn of the cattle. So that's what's going to happen. That's what this plague was about. It's a pretty big deal. But God gives instructions in here what to do. And this is going to pay attention because this is going to pay attention. This is going to pay dividends for later on in the story. It says on the 10th day. That's what it tells us. It directs them. On the 10th day, according to the father's house, what they need to do is they need to select a lamb. A lamb without blemish. A perfect lamb. They need to keep it until the 14th day. And then they need to sacrifice that lamb at twilight. Here in that Hebrew text, basically saying between the two evenings, between Thursday night and the next night, the evenings, that's when it's to be sacrificed. Take the, some of the blood from that lamb, the Paschal lamb that you're sacrificing, and put it on the doorpost, right? We've seen that. Why do we do that? Why do we have to put blood on the doorpost of their house? It's because... God says, I will pass through the land of Egypt, and I will strike all of the firstborn of the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment. The blood shall be a sign for you, 
And when I see the blood on the doorposts, what will he do? He will pass over to know that they are with God. So remember that as we flash back or actually move forward to our story found here in Matthew 21. The first point I'm going to really talk about is called the chosen lamb. If you're a note taker, I'm calling it the chosen lamb. Verse 1 says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples. So if you look at Bethpage, Bethpage really means house of figs. And there's speculation on why, but really it probably just had a lot of fig trees around, so they call it the house of figs. Bethpage was uh, less than a mile east of Jerusalem. So if you're, you're looking at Jerusalem and you look to the east, you'll see the Mount of Olives. And on the southeast slope of the Mount of Olives, this is where you will find Bethpage. And I think we have a picture to see kind of the view. And so here, here is, you're standing on the Mount of Olives. Probably Bethpage is to the, the back of you where this journey starts. And you'll see the walk. Now there's obviously some tombstones here, but there's a pathway that goes where you can see the temple. So Jesus, as he's doing this, as he's walking this, 2.65 million, did I tell you, that were there, probably could see what was going on and the commotion that was happening on his way. It was a festival, right? So there's a lot of things going on. People selling stuff, celebrating what? So that, it's key that as we look at that. So we also know that Bethpage was about a day's journey. It was, it was a mile away, but it was within the limits of how the far they could travel for the Sabbath. Because they had certain rules. In fact, it was within the limits that you could still bake bread at Bethpage and it'd be okay for sac the sacrificial use in the temple. Because it had to be within 2,000 cubits away from that. So this is all key. So he didn't break any rules by coming on the Sabbath from this distance. In fact, the town was positioned perfectly distance away to enter Jerusalem on this triumphal entry. It makes sense that he would have come from this direction to the city, from Bethpage down the, over the valley into the area. There's some messianic uh, associations that you see in Zechariah 14.4. It says, on this day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. So we're talking about the coming of God. So there's a lot of pictures and prophecy that ties to this entire process of him making his way. Verse 2 says, Go into the village in front of you immediately, and you will find a donkey and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. Only in the Gospel of Matthew does it talk about both the donkey and the colt. And there's commentaries, and people will agree or disagree of why they think that is. We know that it, it points to a prophecy in Jeremiah 9, 9 that we'll look to in a moment. But also, if practically, if you're thinking about a colt that has never been ridden, first of all, a colt that's never been ridden is great honor for that first person to ride that colt. It's great honor in that culture. Second of all, if the mother, the donkey, was riding alongside an unbroken colt that would provide comfort to that colt. Imagine this colt has never been ridden, and now it's being asked, not literally, okay, like, hey, colt, you're going to be doing this, but it's being asked to take this journey that we just saw, this mile journey with crowds yelling, people cheering, palm branches going, cloaks on top. That's traumatic, and if you've ever ridden any beast of burden before that has not been trained, it doesn't usually go well. They call it breaking an animal for a reason. So the illustration of that mother donkey coming alongside is powerful in that. Verse 3 continues and says, If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. Right here we see that they sent and went and got those two animals. And Jesus is referring to himself as the Lord. He's not hiding anymore. He's coming in. He's telling people, I am the Lord. This is what's happening. But I'm going to ask you a question. If somebody that you didn't know came up to you and said, hey, let me get the keys to those car, your car. I need it. Or even if they said the Lord needs it, you're probably going to hesitate. But that just, just shows you the power of God here. There's a few scenarios that could have happened. Maybe they heard about Jesus, and when they said the Lord, maybe they uh, were around when Lazarus was raised, and so they said, sure, take him. Maybe they knew the two disciples. They were friends. They were around the neighborhood because we know they spent time here at Bethany and Bethpage in the past. Maybe there was a prearrangement at some point. 
They, the weeks before, they said, hey, we're going to come on this Sabbath day or on this Palm Sunday of the celebration, and we're going to need these two animals. And it was an agreement. Or, or maybe God just orchestrated it, and they allowed it to happen because it was fulfilling prophecy, which I think is most likely. The Lord, right there in verse 4 and 5, it took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, a colt, a fowl of beast of burden. I think it's foal, beast of burden. Zechariah 9 9 predicts this exactly of what was going to happen to the T. Now they took out the part in Zechariah 9 9 where it says, Rejoice greatly. That was in front of 9 9, probably in order to, to set the mood. That this was, although we call it the triumphal entry, and I'm sure your Bible says that at the beginning of this text, is it really a triumphal entry? It is a coronation of a king, so to speak, but it is really the start of his pathway to the cross. So they potentially took that out where it says rejoice greatly. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them on, the, put them on their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowds spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. You see, cloaks in those times would have been a symbol of submission. To take off your cloak and to put it on an animal or to place it on the ground for the animal to actually literally walk on would have been a place of submission. And the palm branches in their culture would have represented victory. Even though they probably cut other branches down, but whatever was available, palms were the most common that you would have seen in that. So all illustrations of what was going on, the coronation of a king. Verse 9 says, And the crowds that went before him and have followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. What does Hosanna mean? It says, Save us now. It is mostly said in prayers, but they were shouting it out to this guy on a colt, save us now. This crowd could have been very confused. Very confused. First of all, the crowd is a mixture, right? It was probably people just trying to figure what's going on. But they were confused because they're looking for a savior. They're saying, save us now. But yet they're seeing this individual that's not riding on a war horse. He's not accompanied by an army. He's got family members. He's got outcasts with him. They're probably confused. Even though they're claiming who he is, he is a prince of David's line. Right there it says, Hosanna to the son of David. But they acknowledged it. I always wondered why didn't the Roman soldiers just take him right then? If they just took him right then, that would have saved them a lot of hate and discontent later on. My only thought is that crowd had to have been so frenzied, so excited, so ready for this to happen that they would have been turned on and outnumbered quicker than they would like. So here is that entry as he's coming in. 10 says, And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? That word stirred up comes from the root word earthquake. Now I've been to concerts. I've been to sporting events. I've seen news reports in South America and soccer stadiums that collapsed on the, the earthquake of people cheering and shouting. But I can only imagine the scene. 2.65 million people are going to do when this is happening and coming up. If we're just picturing it as we're walking through this movie. It's very possible that Jesus never came this direction before. He probably, because he's always trying to come in the night or trying to be discreet, would come through a different gate called the Sheep's Gate. The sheep's gate is what they would use where they would bring all the sacrificial animals through. That's probably where he's used to going. But now he's coming as the king. He's announcing it. There's a crowd because he's coming to fulfill the final prophecy. So that first one was the chosen lamb. Second one is the road to the cross. So after this triumphal entry, after this, our reading this morning, we see that things start to turn towards the cross very quickly. And I want to go through just a few events during the week, Monday through Thursday, that would have brought him closer to that moment. We know Monday, the next day, Jesus walks into the temple, and that's when he starts turning over the tables because he sees how they're treating God's house. This is an opportunity for him to say, this is my house. Only thing that happens here is what glorifies God and God alone. 
Not what you're doing on the money changers' tables. We saw, shortly after that, he curses a fig tree. That's symbolic for Israel. So the is, fig tree dies. He's saying, Israel, you are barren. You are not producing fruit. In fact, there's a commentary, commentary that says, Israel had turned into a dead, lifeless ritual without vitality or vir- virility, which no longer was accomplishing God's purpose. And I wonder about us sometimes as a church. Are we like Israel? Are we dead, no longer accomplishing God's purpose? Are we barren like Israel was? Are we going through the motions of religious activity, just going to our programs and being happy and checking out and not reading our own word, not spending time in prayer? Or are we like our mission? Are we captivated and changed by what Christ is doing, what Christ did for us, the grace and mercy that he gave to us. We're unable to be silent to the rest of the world and how he saved us. I wonder, is that us? Tuesday, he goes back to Mount Olives. There's a temple controversy, and we see that there's some rulers are starting to get ugly. They're not questioning the miracles that Jesus did because people observed it. What they're doing is they're questioning what authority he did those miracles miracles under. And that's the key to what authority did he do it under. Wednesday continues through the week. Jesus is teaching at the temple. And this is where we see the Sanhedrin really start to plot to kill Jesus. But Jesus is always in control. That's what's amazing throughout this whole narrative. In fact, Matthew verse 26, 2 tells us that he tells his disciples, hey, I'm going to die. In fact, that's the sixth time he said, I'm going to die. And he said, I'm going to die on Passover. And they said, no, you're not. They're in verse 5. They say, no, you're not. In fact, the people who later on said, we're going to kill you, said, we're not going to kill you. We're not going to kill him on the Passover. My question is, when did Jesus die? On the Passover. So even in death, even on the way to dying for our sins, Jesus was still in charge not his enemies. Another example of the control he had. Thursday continues, Last Supper, goes into the garden. We spent a lot of time last year on that, about the uh, upper upper room discourse and all that piece of what that looked like, and we'll jump back to that a little bit later. But here we're coming to the end of the week when it's the end hour. First point, chosen lamb. The second point was the road to the cross. And the third point is the power under control. Power under control. I want to share just a couple examples of that that happened on that Good Friday event. Two of, of my, my favorite scriptures and references and just things that give me strength. The first one is the betrayal and, and, address, and arrest. We see Jesus is speaking with his disciples at the garden. They're there. And we know that Judas is coming with his crew to arrest them. So Judas is in tow. They got swords. They got lanterns. They got clubs. He's got a Roman cohort with them, 300 to 600 Roman soldiers. They were probably on a garrison nearby, and they, they came along. And they're coming with the chief priests and the Pharisees to arrest Jesus. Jesus knows this, of course. Judas comes up to him and calls him rabbi, which was kind of the wink-wink to the Pharisees that this is the guy. Kissed him on the cheek, which is very customary. And again, Jesus knowing this, and the soldiers are looking for him. They said, um, when he said, who are you looking for? That's what Jesus says. They said, we're looking for Jesus the Nazarene. And what does Jesus says? I am he. He says, I am he. This is the key part. Whereupon the guard and the soldiers drew back and fell to the ground. Literally, the voice of Christ turning to a cohort of Roman soldiers spoke, I am he, they fell to the ground. That's not a a figurative thing. They fell to the ground. The power that he had at his disposal, he chose to use or not use because he was in control. It's amazing to me that sometimes we gloss over that. And the second one is the trial. Picture, he's before Pilate and they're having this discussion and Pilate really doesn't want to do this. He's, there's some dreams going on. And so he's having this discussion, and Pilate enters the headquarters. This is found in John 19. And he said, Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? And then this is it right here. Jesus said, 
You would have no authority over me unless it has been given to you above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin, speaking of the Pharisees. You have no authority over me unless it has been given to you above. The power that is withheld there, I take great comfort in that verse. We are all have, someone's in charge of us all. Somebody's in charge. For husbands, it's your wife. If, if you got a boss, it's somebody. It could be your kids. But the reality is we have to come to face the grips that we're all in charge. But the only power that they have is what God allows them to do. So when I was in the military, you have to do like evals and fit reps and, you know, performance reviews for everybody who's got jobs. I used to stick this verse in my performance review when I wrote my comments. I'd put that under, make sure they only had power that what God gave them. Now it worked for some people. Some people didn't care. But so try it once. Put that in your performance review and see if th that'll actually work. So we have this power under control here that I think is, is key as we're going through this. We're talking about walking through this triumphal entry. But as we talked about the entrance of the triumphal entry, did you catch the parallel of our flashback? Did you catch the parallel? If you didn't, let me help you connect the dots here from Exodus 12. So Exodus 12, it says, 10th day, right, pick a lamb. Well, Jesus entered Jerusalem on the 10th day of Nisan, which in the Hebrew calendar, March, April time frame. So Jesus literally came the same day that they were supposed to pick a sacrificial lamb. Coincidence? I don't know. It says this was four days before Passover, right? So the Jews was selected four days before Passover. The Paschal lamb in Exodus was used to mark that on the doorpost. Four days, keep them safe. All right. On the same day the Jewish people would select a lamb, Jesus walked in. Let's parallel this. Exodus 10. Remember this? On the tenth day, take a lamb. Well, Jesus is coming. Here's the lamb. The lamb should be without blemish. Sinless. Without blemish. Christ coming, perfect. Keep it until the 14th day. That's what it tells us in Exodus. Well, he was with them for four days. 10 plus 4, 14. Coincidence? Fulfillment of prophecy? Sacrifice it at twilight. Between the evenings, Jesus was sacrificed on that cross as the lamb. Take some of the bloods and put it on the two wooden doorposts. Blood on the cross beams of the cross. I will pass through the land of Egypt. This is Exodus 12. He's going he's gonna to judge. He's going to judge. But the blood shall be a sign. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. The blood of Christ on that cross that was born, sacrificed for you and for me. The perfect sacrifice on the 14th, the same day they would sacrifice their lambs in the Old Testament, made the ultimate and final sacrifice for us. It is not a coincidence. It is a fulfillment of prophecy. Why don't we ever see this? I don't ever see this. The New Testament people got it right. We know that John 1, 29 says, the next day we're talking about John. He says, hey, Jesus is coming towards him. And he said, what? Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. We should have picked it up then. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Hebrews 7, 27 says, he sacrificed for sins once and for all. The final, once and for all. No more. It doesn't have to be done. When he offered himself came himself on a colt. No one forced him into Jerusalem during Passover on the 10th to be sacrificed on the 14th, the shedding of his blood, so sins are passed over. We have to get that. We have to understand that in this day of Palm Sunday. Triumphal, yes. Necessary, yes. 
But we have to understand the gravity of what this was. Throughout the New Testament, in Revelation, it talks about, Then I saw a lamb looking as if he had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. Over and over and over. The three points that we have to remember this week. Payment in full on the cross, the conquering of death, and new life in Christ. Now two of those things are coming later in the week. But as we go through this week, we need to understand and what that looks like. All right, we're backing up. We're on Thursday now. I know I took you to Friday almost, but we're back on Thursday. And the Lord's Supper in that upper room with his disciples and his people, as he's sharing stories, getting ready to tell them what is going on. They're so confused. And he's telling about his death and, and all these other illustrations. And, if, and they just don't know what's going on. They're excited for the celebration. And this is the night he was betrayed. And we see that the institution of the Lord's Supper is there, found in Matthew 26, 26 through 29. And it's laid out exactly what happened with the breaking of the bread and drinking of the cup. And what this was and how often to do this. And then we see Paul later on in 1 Corinthians. He addresses this to the early church about the Lord's Supper and what that looks like. But there's caveats to it. We just don't take it flippantly. In fact, the first caveat is you should never eat the bread or take the cup in an unworthy manner. And what does that mean? That just means make sure you're right with the Lord in that. And what we do is we see a lot of times in traditional Southern Baptists, and I'm one of them, um, churches where we don't take communion as much as some other places do. And I think that's a, a reaction or a knee-jerk reaction, maybe not fair, because we want it to be special. We don't want it to be this weekly thing that we just do it. Okay, it's, it's the Lord's Supper. We're doing it again. We want to pause and reflect. Now, maybe we can take it more often, but I think that was the idea of why that was done traditionally in our church. The manner we should do, we should examine ourselves. That's the second thing. How do we examine ourselves? There's a few things. Remembrance. That's what this is about, right? Take this and remember. Every time you take this, remember what I did. First of all, what happened first in Exodus 12? Then what's getting ready to happen on Good Friday on the cross? Remember what Christ did for you. That's what this moment in the Lord's Supper is about. We also should reflect. Remember and reflect. Reflect on the things that God is doing in your life. Reflect on the things that God has done in your life. By the way, we don't produce light ourselves, if you didn't know that. We don't produce light. The only light we have is reflected of what Christ has done in our life. There's no good there. It is only the reflection. We know that Christ in our, Holy Spirit in us comes out because we can't help but to show it. So it's that reflection that we need to, to go to God for. The third piece is repentance, and it's crucial that we do this. This is repentance. That's, that's getting before the Lord. That's getting in the presence before the throne and say, God, I messed up. I messed up this morning like six times. I had an argument in the car. Or I did these things, A, B, and C. These sins that I have committed against you, and I just want to bring them before you. Before I take this communion, before I join with my church family, I want to give that to you. And that's something we need to do. Only those who know Jesus, by the way, only those who have a personal relationship with Christ, who understand the remembrance, should partake in Lord's Supper. It's not cruel. It's not mean. It's to protect you. It's to keep you. It's, it's a special time with like-minded believers. So I would say if you're living in an unwillful, unrepentant sin right now as a Christian, just don't take it. No one's going to judge you. No one's going to look at you. Let the cup pass. Because we want to be right with the Lord. The Lord's Supper changed for me about 13 years ago. So you guys know, you're like my ther therapy session, right? So I, t I get to tell you all like see stories and stuff. So 13 years ago, uh, this was a, a particular time I was in Afghanistan serving with a Marine unit in a pretty kinetic area. A lot of stuff going on. And I would do services for these Marines, and we'd go out every day, and they would rid the world of bad guys and all that good stuff. Or what they would call it, they'd go pick a fight. So this particular time, we're on the flight line, and uh, we're doing a message. And it's a very eclectic group of people that come to the service. And we would use whatever we could find for the bread. I think we had crackers this time, and juice, or Gatorade, or whatever that was. And this particular time, it struck me in a couple ways. One is, as I was passing the plate around with the crackers in 
the plate, the hands reaching in the plate was stark. One, there was blood on, on their hands. And they were cleaning out from the last casualty. Or there was grease on another's hand from turning a wrench and getting a helicopter back in the air to help support their brothers at arms. And it, it just struck me the, the severity of that time together. And the contrast of the blood and the white and the blood that covered our sins. And it, it wrecked me at that time. And then I also recognized that out of this 12 to 14 people that were here to, to have this time with me, that one or two of them most likely would not be there next week. See, at that time, we, I think I had lost about 500 people in that six-month time frame. So the, the seriousness of that time was moving. And it was precious and it was special that we get to come together as a group of believers and to cast our sins before the throne, ask for that forgiveness, reflect on the things that has already been accomplished on the cross, what's already been done, shown in Exodus, and then shown here in the Gospels of what Christ has done. And then asking for that, and then commune together as one. And so this morning, we're going we're gonna to pause a little bit more than we normally do. Someone's, we're going to be playing some soft music in the background, but I just want us to, to sit in silence, well, with some music in the background for a few minutes. And just reflect. Do that. I want you to reflect on the things that God has done in your life. I want you to remember the victories, the monuments, the blessings that he's given you. The fact that you're in this room is a blessing. And then I want you to repent. Think of the things that you have done. Ask God to reveal the things in your heart and repent. And, and I'm okay if it's repenting with the person next to you. Because I've been at church after an argument with the person next to me and had to turn to them and say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? We're about to take Lord's Supper and I do not want to go in an unworthy manner. And I'm okay with that. But we're going to have a, just a small time of silence and then I'll pray with us and then we'll partake in the Lord's Supper. Lord, we do thank you for your holiness. We thank you for allowing us to share this time together as we go before you, as we remember the things that you have done. can't imagine what that would have felt like knowing going into your death while people were cheering, save us. And Lord, we don't deserve it, and you did it while we are still sinners. And so, Lord, we just want to remember the greatness of what you've done and something that we cannot repay. That was not a free gift, Lord, because it cost you your life. Lord, but we also know that you rose again in the newness of life, Lord. Lord we reflect on the things that we've, we've been able to do and able to accomplish, and, and we're just so so grateful for the things that you have um, given to us. And Lord, we just do want to confess our shortcomings, the things that we failed at, relationships that we hurt. And so we want to place all those at the foot of the cross. We know that you look at our sin as far as the east is to the west, and that never joins, Lord. And so 
we just thank you for that. And as a family, as we come together and get ready to partake in the bread and the cup, we just ask that you bless this church. This is your church. And so, Lord, we thank you. We look forward to the things that you're going to do. And as we reflect on this week, we look forward to celebrating your resurrection. Lord, guide us and keep us in everything that we do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It says, For I received from the Lord what I have also delivered to you, that Jesus, Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Praise God. As we finish up, I just want to leave you with a thought. I wonder, as that crowd was cheering, save us, and, and yelling for the Savior and for the King of Kings, I wonder if some of that crowd wandered their, their way into the time when they were yelling, crucify him. It doesn't say it in Scripture, but there's, with that amount of people and the way we are as humans, it wouldn't surprise me. So my question to you as we leave is, what Jesus are you calling to? Are the one who's going to just fix all your problems immediately, free you from all your challenges and risks? Or are we humble enough to trust in the Lord's timing and his redemption and his way? Remember, this week, the payment in full of our sins, in full, the check cleared, conquering of death, and the new life in Christ. Please stand as we finish up as we worship our Lord.